I always have to do that. The talk will be posted next week by Monday afternoon on innovatebio.org. So you'll be able to find it on our website. Just go to the front page and look for the section on presentations and click it when you see it. Next week, we're going to have talks on the Immunotherapy Hub and a workforce analysis that they've done. And I will be talking again, I'll be talking next week about uh, our project on antibody engineering and the antibody engineer hackathon that's going to be happening the first week of August. So we'll, um, I hope you can join us. So today we have Dr. John McDowell from Delaware Technical Community College talking about the CRISPR curriculum. And after John talks, I'm going to be talking about an ATE project that includes biotechcareers.org. You can find information about these projects at innovatebio.org. Each talk will be about 20 minutes and we're gonna have the talks back to back and the questions will be after the talks. Feel free to put questions in chat. And at the end, we will also have a survey that we'd really like you to complete. And uh, I guess without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Dr. John McDowell. Great, thanks, Andy, um, and thank you uh, to the, the broader Innovate Bio community. Um, it has been uh, incredibly supportive having everybody um, involved and uh, taking advantage of and connecting uh, through our Innovate Bio, or I'm sorry, our ATE um, project uh, with everybody. So I guess with that, I will, I will start off uh, and, and go in. So um, as Andy said, I'm an instructor at Delaware Technical Community College. Um, so um, if you've never been to Delaware, <laughs> I'd love to have you come out and visit us. We're a small state, obviously, on the other side of uh, the country. I'd like to start off and just talk a little bit about the college to set things up. Um, and then about our project. Um, we are, as I will discuss, the only community college in the state of Delaware, but we do have multiple campuses. Um, and one thing that I've been able to um, and in, have enjoyed is talking to community college faculty from across the country and how they might implement and bring in gene editing curriculum to their courses. That's a major thrust of what we're doing with our project. Um, and for some people in some systems of community colleges, there's a lot of of um, stringency in terms of how new curriculum gets developed and if you teach it the same way on every campus or every offering and what, what that may look like in different ways. Um, so I, I just wanna put that out to the beginning that um, I, I am um, hopeful that if you have questions and you're thinking about um, bringing in some of the activities that I'm talking about in this project, talk today um, that you can reach out to me and I'd love to share some of our experiences because we've been doing this at multiple campuses um, across our system um, and have gotten some good experience in, in going through and doing that. So um, just kind of a plug up front. So talk a little bit about the college, talk about the project and talk about some changes that have come about since last year. So some of the people that are here I can see um, are, are uh, repeat uh, people from um, previous uh, talks. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some new stuff that we've done along the way. Okay. Um, so um, I'm <laughs> obligated to put this up at any talk that I'm talking about our college, our college mission. Um, th th I, I do want to just kind of spin this forward. I think that we all do this. You know, we're trying to put our students in the best positions to move forward. Um, it's very helpful that um, Sandy will be talking about jobs later on. Obviously, that is a major thrust of what we're looking at for our students. And a driving force for doing this project was to bring this cutting edge gene editing curriculum to our students so that they are best prepared to go into to, uh, the workforce where these techniques will be commonplace. So give them the ability to learn these tools. Um, beyond that though, I think that it, this is something that students have heard about. This is obviously a fast growing um, high profile area of science. Um, so having students engaged and, and active in learning about this is really important. It's a good hook to get them interested are more interested in science. Um, it's something that they can connect to easily. Um, and in areas such as bioethics, I think it's important that when you have students that are learning this area, that they become um, part of the dialogue going forward because they're well-informed. So I think that these things feed in naturally. Uh, and also just the, by the nature of the science that's involved, um, it can touch upon pretty much every biology course or any biology course moving forward. So although we talk about this specifically in the altering of gene and we teach it in our capstone level courses, I think that there uh, is a place for this in, in any uh, biology course. 
All right, as promised, a, a quick tour through Delaware. Um, we, uh, a small state, we've got three counties. Um, there are four campus locations for Delaware Tech that are spread throughout the state. Uh, in the northern part of the state, which is um, kind of uh, just the, the southern extended suburb from Philadelphia. We have two campuses, um, the Stanton campus and the uh, George campus. The George campus is located in Wilmington, Delaware, so an urban setting. Um, I teach at the Stanton campus, uh, which is located in Newark, Delaware, not very far from the University of Delaware. Um, in the center of the state, in the state's capital of Dover, we have the Terry campus, uh, and then located in the southern part of the state um, in Georgetown, Delaware, is the Owens campus, and, and that's not too far away from the beaches. So again, if you ever come and visit Delaware, I'd love to host you, and uh, if you come during the summer, we've, we, we have pretty nice beaches to, to go to as well. Um, in terms of this talk, though, um, our biology and biotechnology programs that I'll discuss that are incorporated this curriculum are located at the Stanton campus as well as that Southern Georgetown campus. And faculty member Michael Boney, uh, who teaches at that one, uh, has been involved in this progress. And, and we also collaborate uh, very well in terms of making sure that our courses uh, are, are in alignment in terms of materials, but recognizing um, the unique flavor that we bring to each one of them. Um, so when we talk about students that have been trained, they're getting this uh, curriculum at both of those campus locations because it's a college wide initiative that we have going. Okay, um, within our program of biotechnology, we have two tracks. Um, both are associated of applied science degrees. We have a biological sciences tract, which is our connected degree. So we've got this articulated to a number of close by um, universities, students finish their associate's degree uh, at Dell Tech and then are able to go in as junior level students to the, the different uh, colleges that we have the connected degree with. Um, for us at the Stanton campus, most of those students articulate into um, programs, aligned programs at the University of Delaware. Um, we have somewhere around 140 students enrolled in that program uh, currently. Um, most students that come through are, are, are in that program. Um, but we also have a more, um, workforce focused program, our, our technician pathway um, and uh, letters that may come up at different places. Uh, the first one is our BIS program. Our second one is our BIT for the technician program. Um, and, and the goal of this program is to, to get training in for students to be able to go in directly into the workforce. Um, the current enrollment of this program is smaller, um, somewhere around 20 students. Um, however, students right now um, are um, getting through the program and hired very quickly, including uh, one student that I'll highlight going through this. In terms of the gene editing curriculum that I'll be discussing, um, students get this as part of the capstone courses of genetics and molecular biology, which are included in both of those pathways. So although we have the two degree programs, students in either of the two pathways are getting trained in this particular curriculum. All right, so um, jobs. Uh, obviously, we're very uh, work very closely with our local industry and in, in um, making sure that students um, following graduation know of their um, options and uh, connect well. To, that we have opportunities for students to go into those jobs. This is just a list of some of the companies uh, and as well as some of the graduates that we've had over the past couple of years that have gone uh, into a variety of different companies. Um, Delaware at one time, um, obviously uh, the College of Dell Tech fed a lot of people into the chemistry industry in DuPont. Um, so in addition to our biotech program, we also have um, a historically strong chemtech program. Um, but we, we have good connections to have students go into you know, a number of different industries. Um, this takes on a variety of different flavors. Delaware does a lot of support work uh, in terms of production of uh, materials for other companies. Um, pharmaceutical company or industry is still very strong in Delaware. Um, and we've got, as I said, the University of Delaware close by. So technician positions there um, are strong. I'm very happy that we have two current graduates that are working in the DNA sequencing and genotyping core at the University of Delaware. Um, and we have a very longstanding strong relationship because of the training that they have coming out from our program. Um, our grant program, as I'll talk about, is a collaborative grant program with the Gene Editing Institute, which um, is housed under the Christiana Care Hospital System, major um, healthcare provider for the state of Delaware, the major healthcare provider for the state of Delaware. Um, it is a unique 
um, Institute set up. Um, they've actually just recently spun out part of uh, their group as a company because of advances in uh, a targeted gene editing therapy um, related to cancer. Um, but as part of that collaboration, um, we'll talk about has impacted this project, but we've also had three graduates now that are working for the Gene Editing Institute. So um, definitely having students prepared and ready to go into those positions. Um, over on the right-hand side uh, is Naisha Brown um, that's listed as going to CROTA. Um, we have, you know, like many people, uh, students that are in different parts of their pathway way of careers. Um, Nye is an example of a post vac student who had earned a bachelor's uh, degree, um, did not have the skills required for entry level positions, um, and came to Dell Tech for the biotech program to get those specific trainings. Um, she was offered a job with Crota um, last spring, two weeks before graduation, uh, which is phenomenal, um, except as her instructor, because at that point she was ready to head on and I needed material for her, our assessment program, which were difficult to get out of her, but extremely happy you know, that she was able to go through and do that. Um, she also came back last week as part of our program advisory committee and was able to share her experiences with the program with everybody. Um, and she took a uh, advanced step, I would say, through our gene editing program and was able to take some of the material that we had in coursework and have an independent mentored research project as part of a, a mentored research student over the past year. And I'll, I'll talk and show a little bit about what she did because I think it's a interesting um, and important kind of additional activity to, to what we've been doing um, through the grant throughout the program. Okay, um, so we are in kind of our second cycle of uh, NSF funding on gene editing uh, curriculum. So we've had two ATE projects and we're in our third year um, of, of the second one. Um, it is a collaborative project between Dell Tech and the Gene Editing Institute, um, which has been a fantastic partnership because we work with people who are experts in the field. Um, they develop the science, they have the background knowledge, um, and then we work with them in order to be able to bring those curricular uh, techniques and material into our classes. And that includes both materials for the classroom as well as lab activities. Um, and we've actually are up to three different types of lab activities that we can do with the students. Um, we do this in both of our BIS and BIT program, as I mentioned. Uh, and in addition to the impact that we have for the students here, um, both as part of the mission of the Gene Editing Institute, as well as the support for the AT projects. Um, we have professional development opportunities for community college faculty to be able to come get training in um, the gene editing techniques. So um, for this audience, uh, for anybody who has not joined us in the past, uh, we are looking to have additional workshops um, coming up in May and June as the semester ends, uh, as well as uh, we're going into and applying for a no cost extension and, and we'll hopefully be able to offer those over the next year. Um, offering workshops during the time of the pandemic was obviously very difficult. Um, we came up with some online delivery mechanisms, but I don't think that there's any substitute for being in place in a lab doing the work and, and talking, meeting with other people. So um, more information to, to come on that. Okay, um, through the two rounds, we've been able to um, expand uh, the equipment and kind of the physical infrastructure that we have for training and coursework. This has included um, the, the full build out of a um, tissue culture training room. Um, one of the feedback pieces that we got from our advisory committee over time was the importance of doing uh, mammalian cell tissue culture. Um, we needed space and equipment in order to do that. So the first ATE grant, um, we were able to, to purchase materials. Um, the picture on the top, uh, you can see the lab kind of set up ready to run. And on the bottom, these are students from the current semester in our biotechnology course who are working on um, their cell culture techniques um, in order to um, you know, advance what they're doing in that course um, and also prepare uh, cells that we'll be using in the molecular biology course um, as part of labs at the end of the semester for a gene editing activity. Um, this material comes into these capstone courses, genetics and molecular biology, which is essentially 
uh, the biology courses taken in the second year of uh, the degree programs. Um, we have the theory in the background. Um, students do a scientific literature project, uh, which they are currently working on uh, some presentation skills with that. Um, they work on experimental design, so how they would go from beginning to end, coming up with how to use these tools appropriately. Um, we've got the lab activity where they're performing um, CRISPR gene editing activities, um, discussions of bioethics, um, and analysis of DNA sequence in, in bioinformatics. So again, all of these are centered around gene editing. However, all of those components or many of those components fit well um, in various topics of, um, of biology. So again, if you're thinking of incorporating this, this is just kind of a modification of curriculum that many people are already doing. Um, I highlighted the last thing in there, uh, another um, uh, new development that we have uh, through college uh, funding process, we've been able to buy an Oxford nano for minion sequencer. Um, so I have a research student that is working uh, very hard uh, to analyze data out of that. And one of the big goals of this is to analyze the results that we get out of gene editing in class and have students continue to enhance their bioinformatics skill and kind of build up those pieces, which, which we see as being very important. So um, another exciting kind of new area that we can tie into some of the gene, acti gene editing activities that we're doing. Um, the three labs that we have um, touch upon a variety of different organisms. We have a, a gene editing um, lab uh, developed here for yeast, which knock out the add to gene, which gives you a color change. Um, this has been worked on um, and optimized with students at the Owens campus. Mike Boney spent a while uh, because of his interest in yeast and in, in coming up with an optimal way to increase the, the color change. Um, but this is done within those yeast cells. Again, yeast are pretty easy to grow um, and uh, easy to manipulate in lab setting um, as a, uh, a model eukaryotic system. Um, we've also done uh, as part of the coursework as well as some of these professional development training workshops uh, an in vitro gene editing reaction. Uh, this was developed at the Gene Editing Institute um, and is uh, a really powerful way for students to go through all of the steps in gene editing. So instead of taking materials, adding them into a cell, all of the editing is done inside of a tube. So essentially we have a plasmid with the LAC-Z gene. We have all of the uh, nucleases, guide RNAs, et cetera, that are assembled in vitro added to the plasmid, digestion takes place in the tube, a mixture of um, repair enzymes from eukaryotic cells are added as a cell-free mixture to allow for um, the correction of that lesion with um, a genetic lesion with a um, donor DNA. And then because it's a plasmid with the LAC-C gene, we can transform those into E. coli and look for the readout of whether we've had editing or not by looking at the differences between blue and white colonies. If it edited, we had a change, they're white, if they're the wild type, unedited sequence, they remain blue. So again, I think many labs um, and many courses utilize blue-white screening while they're working on it. Um, here, we're just giving it that twist of, of doing some gene editing in the tube. So anybody who's already doing those activities, you've got the material necessary to, to do that. Um, that particular lab activity um, is available as a commercial kit now because of um, the, act, the work that we've done, um, developed as part of a three-way agreement with the Gene Editing Institute, Dell Tech, and the company Rockland. Um, it's available either directly through Rockland or now available through Carolina Scientific. And the final activity that we have that those students were working on in the previous slide, uh, working on their, their cell culture techniques is to do a uh, editing activity of uh, an EGFP gene that has been incorporated into uh, mammalian cells. Uh, in this case, the EGFP gene has been mutated so that it's no longer able to produce uh, a green fluorescent protein. And through the gene editing, um, CRISPR activity, there's a repair process that takes place in order to correct the mutation and restore the phenotype of producing a green fluorescent protein. And so a picture of that reaction uh, is shown on the bottom right-hand side that we ran in one of our professional development workshops. And you can see there's a couple of green cells that are lighting up um, that have been properly edited uh, versus those that the gene had not been corrected. So those are kind of the three flavors that, that we have. And again, it touches upon a variety of different techniques um, and, and a different set of methods that students utilize to do all of that. So 
Um, so that's nice that we get to, to go through those. I, I mentioned the, the kit that we have for the in vitro reaction um, based upon this blue white screening um, and uh, uh, shown in this picture. Um, it's a, you know, a process that can be done um, fairly easily, unlike a lot of gene editing within a living organism. You have to wait for a period of time to cells to recover, to grow and go forward. Here you're doing a transformation of E. coli after the editing process where they grow overnight and you can get your phenotypic result the next day. Um, for us, uh, it's helpful because then we can take the plasmids, or, I'm sorry, we can take the E. coli grow up, purify the plasmid DNA, and do some additional downstream work, whether that's a simple digestion um, with a newly added restriction uh, site that came about as part of the repair, or even taking it further and getting DNA sequence information and, and comparing that. Um, so, you know, it's scalable, depends upon the needs of, of the class that it's going into. Okay, um, I mentioned my students are now um, enjoying the process of getting ready to give a presentation on CRISPR literature. Um, I like to impress upon them that this is a field that is moving extremely rapidly. Um, and I showed this in class, so I figured I, I would put that in here. Um, this is, um, you know, just a, a, from PubMed. I don't know if this is the most scientifically valid way to look at the growth of a field, but for me, it visually points out how fast uh, this uh, area is moving. Um, you've got the list of the number of publications that have come about as part of, um, you know, all these activities. As you can see, if you just type in CRISPR into a search box, you get um, over 3,800 results uh, that come back. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's just from CRISP. This is actually over 37,000 results that come back while you do that. Um, there were 7,000, over 7,000 journal articles that were published a year ago added into uh, NCBI, and that's a larger increase than what they had the year before that. So I enjoy every year when I give the assignment because I get to go and look up how many more have come about since the last year, and it is not trailing off anytime soon. So what that means is it's a tremendous hook for students that are going through. Um, it's been applied to every different division of life, um, probably most, uh, if not all, different model systems, and applied to a variety of different um, disorders and, 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 and other um, conditions that are of interest to students. So doing an activity like this really allows students to put into practice things that they've learned, um, the number of times when they go through a paper and they say, oh, wait, we did that. I remember we, when we did plant tissue culture. Oh, they're doing it there as well. Or I remember when we talked about this particular um, setup, or look, there's those Western blocks that we did before, whatever it is, you know, it's another good hook to reinforce other topics and materials that are coming in as part of our coursework. All right. Um, Nye, uh, I, I showed before our graduate that's working with Crota that was a post back. Um, she was involved in a mentored research project and was interested in taking that in vitro laxi um, setup and moving a little bit uh, further. Uh, blue and white is very nice, but uh, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, I figured a, uh, some green fluorescent protein would also be a nice addition to our talk. Um, many people are familiar with green fluorescent protein uh, and the fact that if you alter just a single amino acid in the central fluorophore, you can actually get a blue fluorescent protein change it to a, a different amino acid, you can get a cyan fluorescent protein. Um, this is the change of just one or two different nucleotides, which is exactly um, why tools like CRISPR gene editing were developed. So Nye, uh, using in vitro system, able to take a plasmid that had a GFP gene on it um, and using a CRISPR-Cas9 process that she helped to, to plan and develop based upon what we talked about in class, um, was able to mutate in a way to get both blue and cyan fluorescent proteins. So the cell pellets from those E. coli when they were grown up or show over on the left-hand side. Um, I spun this back into our molecular biology class last year. Um, I mentioned that we have a lot of um, pharmacy um, and pharmaceutical industry in our area. Our lab equipment that we have in our Chemtech program reflects the training necessary in that area, including tools such as a UV spectrophotometer, these are beautiful fluorescent proteins. So all of the students had their fluorescent proteins, whichever one they were working on, purified them, took them into lab, and were able to analyze the excitation and emission spectra for uh, the various different fluorescent proteins that they had. This is GFP, but we also did it with the BFP that, that Nye was successful in making. And um, you know, just showed, again, kind of that broadening of materials coming out of you know, the training that we have in, in the 
gene editing uh, curriculum. Uh, the last uh, part of this, I have a student this year who's taking this and moving a little bit further, um, getting some brighter fluorescence and also trying some different um, nucleases involved in, um, in CRISPR that, that appear to be, to be working a little bit better. So um, again, students are interested and, and able to, to put this directly to work um, with us. Okay, um, some other things. So the Gene Editing Institute, um, they are the leaders in, in this area and bringing material back to us. Um, they've developed a computer program to allow for the analysis of DNA sequence files. So again, this is kind of a, a um, easier entry point for doing bioinformatic work. This is a, a web-based program in which uh, sequence files, ABI files can be added in, out of batch, and it'll actually pull out and deconvolute um, complex sequences to determine where gene editing has occurred and what sequences come out of it. Um, so we include this as part of our coursework for students to analyze their sequence. Um, and, and again, it has a very low um, requirement for tech technical background in informatics to, to utilize, um, which is very helpful. Um, the Gene Editing Institute themselves are very interested in education. Um, in addition to the collaborative work that we're doing for the community college faculty, they host a number of workshops for high schools and other interested members of the community to, to work on this, as well as host a number of videos describing scientists that um, are impacted by the work that's going on and, and are impacted by doing the work that's going on. So so um, they're committed to, to showing um, women, different underrepresented minority groups, et cetera, involved in this research and um, both doing the lab work as well as benefiting from the advances that come out of it. Um, and so their information is located uh, through their, their webpage. Okay. These are the members of the team. Um, I did see quickly and everybody was coming through. Um, Joe Brooks, who came in as our external evaluator. And uh, unfortunately I'm running out of time and am and, and, and not able to talk about all of the impact that we have, but um, it's been fantastic working with him, being able to um, look at how our students are gaining information, what they're gaining out of the program and feed the evaluation that we get from both students as well as past workshop participants back into the project in order to enhance and build on. And that's been a, a strength of um, the project throughout. Um, it's been great working with a, a collaborative team, uh, Delaware Small, so we can do big things together and uh, look forward to continuing those connections and collaborations with everybody here across the country. So with that, I think I uh, am finished with my part of the talk. Thanks, John. Wow, you, you've been busy. <laughs> this is an impressive body of work. So I'm gonna ask everybody to hold your questions or put them into chat. And I'm also going to quickly, oops, quickly uh, put, speaking of evaluation, a link to our survey in chat. We really appreciate you filling this out at some point. If you have to leave or at the end, I'll put it in chat again later on as well. But the information that you enter really helps us with planning the talks and making sure this is a worthwhile experience for you. All right, so I'm going to talk now about biotech careers and I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to just, I'm just going to leave this here and not put it on the, well, maybe I will just put it on the full screen. We'll see. I'm afraid if I do that, I'll, can you see, can you see the slide? Nick, can you nod your head if you see it or do you just. It looks good, Sandy. Okay, <laughs> thank you. No problem. I'm never sure because when I do full screen, it, it takes up my full screen, so I can't see what's getting shared. All right. So what I'm going to share, what I'm going to share right now, is um, the biotech. I'm going to talk about the biotechcareers.org website. Uh, it's an online resource for biotechnology exploration, and I'm going to go to uh, kind of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So. Many of you, I think, probably would agree with me if I say that in general, if we're talking to students that we meet who are not part of a biotech program, that they don't know much about biotechnology. If we're talking to random high school students or <laughs> random students anywhere, biotech is not really in their, in their domain. And they don't know what people in biotech, if they knew anything about biotech, you know, they might know, they might think, Franken foods or something weird like that. They don't know what people in biotech companies actually do. A lot of them kind of have this idea it might be research, which 
to some extent it's true, but they don't know biotech companies make products or what they do with those products or how they make them. And then even if they knew that biotech companies make some kind of products like vaccines or something, they don't know that there are jobs or where jobs are. If they knew there were jobs, they don't know where the companies are located and that there are jobs even for that matter. So they don't know their jobs and they don't know that many of these jobs could be filled by somebody with a two year degree. If anything, they think that you have to have a PhD to be working in biotechnology, which is a misconception that's found in a lot of places. <laughs> so we, the biotech careers website kind of began with this idea of providing information about the careers that exist and thinking about how we could increase information or increase the interest in biotech and in biotech careers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the site. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data that we've been gathering from students who've been using the site and have seen presentations on the site. And last, a website is not always enough or the only way to reach people. I'm going to talk about a game that we've been working on that can also help with learning about biotech careers and as it turns out, the drug development process or the process of um, getting a company, a, a product out the door from a biotech company. So the site began in 2012. And I want to mention that uh, Linnea, Dr. Linnea Flesher was instrumental in doing a lot of the work on the site. The site was a project that was initiated by BioLink. We were getting, I was a, Linnea and I were both co-PIs on the BioLink National Center, which are a predecessor to Innovate Bio. We were getting a lot of requests from faculty for, for some kind of resource that had information about the jobs in companies. We could find online learning about being a genetic counselor or being a scientist at NIH or something, but you would never find anything about biomanufacturing or quality control or um, validation or any of the kinds of jobs or job descriptions that you might see that actual companies have. So we, we built the site to provide that kind of information. We've got a lot of resources there. I'm not going to go through all of them <laughs> right now. Um, but we do emphasize entry level job information. We're going to be building more about pathways, but we do have an emphasis on technical careers and things that uh, students with a two year degree might be eligible for. The site is actually used very widely in schools. We, as I said, we began it in 2012, so it's been 11 years and the traffic has been growing over the course of those 11 years. These past two years, we've had over, we've had vi visits from over 400,000 people both of the past two years. And about looking from our web logs, we can see about a quarter of those are from schools. So the site is getting widely used. We have kind of worked out four pathways for exploring the site. And uh, these are nouns, right? What are nouns? People, places, and things. So you can explore the site by going straight to people. And we have information about several community college alumni. There's about 36 career profiles of people working in the industry. and. For those of you with community college programs, if you help us find people that would be great profiles on the site, we have links to those colleges. So that's kind of a great way to advertise your programs as well and see where people are working. So we have people, places, we have maps of biotech all over the world and you can drill down and see what's in your area, what companies are in your area and what they do. We have 500 terms that companies use to describe themselves. You can filter by any of those terms and find companies that work on those different topics. And then you can also explore by jobs because it's really helpful to know that there actually are jobs and there actually are jobs that our students are eligible for. And you can find out where those jobs are. You can look at descriptions of those jobs and you can see what skills are needed. All right, so what happens if students use this? Does this does this actually work? We have been collaborating these past few years with Dr. Karen Leung and Dr. Um, Goldner Ashvar from City College of San Francisco and giving talks in their career course. And we've been collecting some data from college students, other students randomly as well, but mostly most of our students are from CCSF. So 
what do students think before and after? These data come from 66 students, and you can see that before they used the site, uh, you know, four of them said they were very aware. And then we have kind of ranges from very aware to slightly aware, and a lot of them said they were not at all aware. But after using the site, of those 66 students, only two said they were not aware of the variety of biotech jobs. We have also looked at some of the factors that are involved in student career choice. And in this case, we ask students if visiting the site and working with the site broadened their ideas about who could who could work in biotech. And you could see here that of 58 students, 56 said yes. Um, here, 57 students, 55 said that working with biotech careers helped them picture themselves in a biotechnology career. And 51 out of 55 students said that it increased the likelihood that they would pursue biotechnology as a career. Now, we don't have any long term data yet, but overall, pretty positive. And since a website isn't always enough, as I mentioned before, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a game that we have for exploring biotech careers, and I'll provide you with a link a little bit later, too. So if you want to test out the game, you're welcome to do so. A lot of our collaborators here come from our, our antibody engineering hackathon. Uh, Dr. Margaret Bryans has been really instrumental in um, some of the ideas in the game. Feather Ives. Um, Francis Weiss Garcia, Dua Hassan, a student who was part of the hackathon. Uh, Todd has really helped with testing it, and also uh, Noah Havilar and uh, Roxanne, my daughter Roxanne, who are avid gamers and have helped us a lot with testing the game too. And real students have been playing the game as well. These are Maggie's students from Montgomery County Community College. And you can see here that our, our real interest in um, how we see the game being used going forward is actually as a board game. They, they printed out their own cards. Uh, the students researched their own antibody products that their companies would be making. And you can see here they're, they're having a good time playing it. What's been fun too, Maggie says, is that going forward with their other courses, they've been able to refer back to the game and say, oh yeah, that would be a good card for this, or that would be a good card for that. And what do they say? Overall, they thought it was fun. Uh, one said it was harsh, challenging, educational, but they liked it. So here is an online version of the game that we made for testing. We don't see this as being a permanent thing, but right now it is, it is free and you can try it. And it helps to describe what the game's all about. So if you've ever played Monopoly, it is this is shorter you can play it in two hours you have a marker that you move around the outside of the game you have uh, product markers that you move from the around the inside of the game you go from the preclinical phase these are antibody drugs by the way you go from the preclinical phase to phase one to phase two three to market whoever gets to market first is the one that wins but to go from one phase to the other you have to have data. And you've got preclinical, phase one, phase two, three data. To get a data card though, you don't just get a data card, to be able to acquire a data card, you have to have hired the right people. And we have um, 14 different kinds of careers that people might fit into. And you have to, there's two of them are the same. So you have to have have those people and you have to have certain kinds of data to get other kinds of data and other kinds of documents. So you work on getting those kinds of data and documents um, and hiring people so you go around the board. So the uh, spots here, you can see there are data and document cards where you have the opportunity to purchase data. You have there are hiring spots here where you have the opportunity to hire people. There are fundraising spots where you have the opportunity to raise money because none of this is free. And along the way, you also might encounter luck and karma. Luck can be good or bad. Karma is 
almost always bad. There's a little bit of good karma in there too. It's almost always bad. But if you have hired the right people, you can protect yourself from some of the bad karma. So we, we want to um, include those ideas about what you might see as you're going around the board. Okay. And now I'm just going to thank the people who've been working on our um, uh, sponsoring the site, past and present sponsors. Thank all of you. And uh, there will be some resources. I'm going to put my PowerPoints into um, on Innovate Bio, and I'm going to quickly show you the game. So share my screen and go to here. All right, so this is Biotech Careers, but it's a hidden page on Biotech Careers. It is game testing Biotechopoly. I'm just going to quickly put that into chat. All right, and if you go to this page, uh, you can. There's a um, a, play, a link you can click where you can get the rules and you can get some of the information that you need to know. So we have a description of what all the careers are that we have in the game right now. We have uh, descriptions of what data cards you need to get to move from one phase to another. And those would be things that you would expect to either have accessible or print out before you play. Um, we have a little video on how to use the game, the video game that is, and we have um, examples of the game. We have three rooms, I can, and I can set up extra rooms if you ever wanted to use this in a class and test it out. That's uh, pretty simple. So if I go to a, a room here, I'm going to click enter. I can click a uh, new game, and it's going to move everything around for me. There we go, and shuffle everything, and I'm going to show you what the cards look like. It's kind of teeny, teeny tiny uh, print. Okay. And uh, yeah, so if I looked at a career card, I would click it, you could see what a career card might look like. So here you see what a validation specialist does. And all these people, there are icons that use to describe the describe the job. And you see that it would cost $100,000 to hire a person of that a, a validation specialist. And I, when I play, I move, I flip all those cards and I kind of move them around. And then as I buy them, I move them down a little bit lower. Um, here's a, an example of a data card. So it's a preclinical phase. And you can see here that they have to be getting um, clinical trial protocols. And the icons are showing the kinds of data that you would have to have to do this. And the icons are also showing um, the kinds of personnel. And on one side, we have some alternatives. So on one side, there are two kinds of roles that they would have need to have hired. That would cost you $200,000. But if you, but you have the other alternative that if you have a, um, I forget who the clipboard person is. If you have a person who fills that role, you could also hire a CRO that is a contract research organization that would cost you a little bit more money, but you might be able to get there quicker. All right, so there's there's some ideas like concepts like that in the game as well. Okay, uh, what a luck card will look like. Here's an example, a rare disease, a rare disease patient group decides they want to fund development of your drug. You could get $5 million. And since that's a windfall, you could spend that all right away. By the way, all of our luck and karma scenarios come from real life. And in the version we're going to be printing later on this summer and bring to high tech we're going to have qr codes on these so that you could look up and see where this came from this is actually a company called vertex some of you may be familiar with the cystic fibrosis foundation funded a lot of the drugs that vertex has on the market okay so that's a example of a luck card uh karma here's an example of karma uh in this case there uh, the fda the Oh, by the way, some of these some of these cards only apply if you're in a certain phase of the development process. So here, this one, if you were in preclinical, this wouldn't apply and it wouldn't be a problem for you. But if you were in phase one or phase two, three, and the FDA comes in and finds um, hard to clean equipment that's hanging from the ceiling, they would fine you, or they would there would be some kind of penalty. In this case, though, that you if you've hired a facilities technician, you're protected 
And so you also get to make a choice about something you might do. We've been trying to put things in to make the game go a little bit faster than two hours. All right, so uh, I'm just going to put all that back and stop sharing. And now we can go through and uh, answer questions. Are there any questions? And, and ask them for John or I both. Nick. So I got a question for both. Uh, so John, do you have a description of the uh, the labs and protocols that you have on your website or how would, how would you get something like that? Or do you want us just to talk to you or? Sure, you can reach out and I can share. I don't, I don't have a list of the protocols up. I mean, the, G, the uh, in vitro reaction, I think that there is a set of directions on the website for the kit since it's out there. Um, so I, I can point you in that direction, but for the other ones, um, I can certainly connect with you and tell you how we do it. Okay. So I see there's a link to the testing page on the survey uh, from Sandra. That's that's great. Um, so Sandra, is that uh, so the game, the online version of the game? Um, did you did you put a link in for that as as well? How how do we get to the online version of the game? And do you think it would be good? You know, we have a classroom of about ten students, uh, or you know, a club maybe on a Friday with a little bit of lunch. You think it would be good to to have that to do something like that? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Okay. And uh, um, yeah, um, I'm hoping next year or probably this summer, there there is a, a place where you can do on-demand printing for um, games. And so I'll make that available so that you could just pay for the supplies and get all that. Okay. Oh yeah, and there's a question about, is it only for two players? I set it up, when I first set up, the online version, I made versions for both two and four players, but I found that, you know, web pages can only have so much information and it was really crowded and really hard to see. So I, I have, I think if you're playing online, it's best if there's two, but I think in general, it's best to have students play as teams because then they can talk to each other and they can make decisions and they can, and that's how Maggie's students have been playing that's how i would recommend and you can have you know four students in a team pretty easily and we have a question for john and if there is pd you would recommend for teachers that want to bring these lab topics to a high school or pre-college program yeah i'll um after i get done answering this i'll go and look through so a lot of the material um i, I mentioned that our collaborative collaborators at the Gene Editing Institute have, as part of their mission, kind of the overall education in this area. Their webpage actually has a lot of resources, including videos describing kind of the science behind gene editing in the field. Um, and there's also videos showing people going through the in vitro lab reaction um, embedded on the page. So I would say as an initial first step, that's probably an easy way to go in and do that. Um, and uh, as far as further PD, um, if you send me your email, we can connect later and I'll, I'll uh, give more thought on um, and, and look into if there are other things that might be directly related to that. There are a couple questions for me about could people print the game? And yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll put a link to that um, when I post the presentation. What I found though, having printed it myself, and um, putting all the, uh, setting up all the cards and getting all the, all the money and everything that my hands were so sore <laughs> after I did this that I thought, oh no, no, there has to be a better way. So um, I found buying the cards <laughs> was a lot easier. <laughs> but yeah, you can print this. And Maggie's students printed it themselves um, we, when we do, when we print it, we set up the cards with, um, let me find an example here. We, we set up the cards with a little plastic, I, I bought plastic sleeves and I printed um, the paper and I have a, um, like a, a, a card, example card that I got from Amazon. So yeah, we, you can, you can definitely do that. And I'll put the information for that on the uh, presentation page when it's posted. Oh, thanks, John. That's helpful. John's put a link to the, um, the Gene Editing Institute in chat. 
which is really good. All right. I think there's one more question on the, the LAXZ deletion um, that came up. So for that, it's a plasmid that has the alpha, well, it's, it's alpha complementation. So it has, I guess, the beta portion of LAXZ on it. Um, it is targeting an actual region on the inside of it where the um, there's a, you know, a direct cut double-stranded break that takes place. And then a repair oligo that is brought in um, that forces things out of frame. So that'll give you an inoperative laxy um, or beta-galactosidase enzyme. Um, and it also introduces a unique restriction site, um, which you can then monitor if you purify the plasmids, do a digest. You can see the difference of whether or not that sequence has been incorporated or not just by running it out on the gel. And, and speaking of games, Jan has pointed out that she has a Trivial Pursuit bioinformatics game, which sounds pretty cool. She also has some pretty cool biomanufacturing games as well that are pretty nice and I think probably easy to incorporate. There's a, a link from, um, uh, we have a link from her presentation, but I'll, I'll make sure it's, it's easier to find on the, uh, did I pay somebody to print the game? Yes, I did. I did. Um, it's a company called uh, The Game Crafter. And I also have uh, games with amino acids, by the way, that you can play Go Fish with. <laughs> so you can learn your amino acid. <laughs> it's playing amino fish or amino rummy. And if, as long as you're into games, because we've had a lot of fun. Oh, can you order it from Game Crafter? Not yet, but you will. it will be available uh, later on this summer. The amino fish you can order from me on Etsy. And we have um, these molecular modeling uh, bridge cards where the decks are carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, and fats. So you can, um, instead of playing hearts, you can play carbs. <laughs> but those are from us on Etsy at uh, Digital World Biology. <laughs> Jan. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to correct myself and say the Trivial Pursuit type game is a biomanufacturing game. Sorry, not bioinformatics. And it's on our kit loan canvas page, all the um, instructions for playing and all the set, a set of cards, et cetera. Yeah, and you've got a lot of different games there for biomanufacturing. Those look like they would be fun. Oh, yeah. So anyway, can you just order things from the Game Crafter? Not yet, but you will. And you can, you can play... Uh, well, you can play my game through the um, online version right now. Jan's you can play uh, right now. And um, I will make sure to get the link. I don't have, I'm not going to be able to find it in four, five minutes. I'll make sure to get the link and put it on the presentation page. So I can just put list of games there. It'll be underneath the, uh, the link to watch a presentation. And I'm going to stop the recording.